I've come to Colombia to build up uh, an interdisciplinary research center that deals with the study of aging and primarily the positive plasticity of aging. So to which degree and how is it possible that we positively modify human aging in its various facets, be it cognition, personality, social functioning, productivity, also um, physical functioning, the physiology of it. Um, and then the center also has a second component that is dealing with bringing all the insights and findings as quickly as possible into the public sphere so that we hope we can make a contribution to how we transform our societies to be societies of longer lives. One of the areas that we focus on is to better understand um, the connection between work environments and the aging process. And we do research on that. Um, and on the translational side, what we have done, we have got funding for creating awards uh, for companies who are doing the right thing in human resource management, in work organization, um, to promote longer productive lives uh, with their employees. And so that is one example. So we have developed a set of criteria that, uh, based on research, uh, would be conducive to supporting productivity and longer fulfilled work lives. And then we just um, put out these awards and hope for companies to apply and show us that they are doing this or they are pursuing that pathway. That's just one example. Another area of work we are doing is uh, on uh, images of aging. Um, which has shown that it is very influential how we think about our own aging, uh, but also in general how society thinks about different phases in life, and that this influences our self-regulation, it influences behavior uh, in the sense of a self-fulfilling prophecy if we expect negative things to be happening with us as we grow older, we can be pretty sure that they will be happening. And on the applied side, on the translational side, um, my colleague Ruth Finkelstein has been running a project that is called Exceeding Expectations, where we got funding to look for New Yorkers that have exceeded the average life expectancy of a typical New Yorker. And so we find these people across different walks of life and interview them and partake in their lives for some time to provide models, um, new images of aging if you wish, uh, so that hopefully people can enrich um, the images that they have in their heads. Well, when we started, started to study wisdom, it was in the 1980s. And the prime motivation for us to get interested in wisdom was to find a characteristic or an ability or a skill that may actually improve as we grow older. At that time in research, um, there has been a strong emphasis on the so-called uh, decline model of aging. And so we were interested whether it is possible to find something that does not go down. And obviously wisdom is one of the prototypical uh, examples for that, according to yeah, folklore and um, some of the writing. And that's how we got uh, to the study of wisdom. Also, it seems that it's an ideal sample case of how different areas of psychological functioning need to work together, need to be integrated and orchestrated to um, produce a greater whole. So how does cognition play together with our emotion regulation, with our motivational orientations uh, in order to produce something that comes close to wisdom? So when we started to study wisdom, we first went back in time and 
ask the question of the wisdom literature, which is as old as humankind, at least as written records of humankind, uh, to find out what had been the understanding of wisdom across historical time and across cultures. That was our first step. And when we did that, we discovered that there were amazing similarities across very diverse cultures and a long stretch of historical time. And for instance, one of the universals was that it always became clear when there was written about wisdom that wisdom had to do with a set of insights and judgments that were of superior quality. It always came through that wisdom was called upon when fundamental, existential and uncertain dilemmas of life were concerned. Which, interestingly, in very similar kinds and ways occur across cultures and across historical time due to the fact that we are one species, it's one anthropology that characterizes us and some of the basic dilemmas, they just come back. They have to do with the fact that we are sexual beings, they have to do with the fact that we are vulnerable in, in our physical uh, body, uh, that uh, we are terminal on this planet and that we are torn between being deeply dependent when we come on this planet to wanting to become autonomous. So these are just some of the basic dilemmas that come up again and again and that really are characteristic for any writing about wisdom across time and culture. And there was um, a third aspect that always came up and that was um, that wisdom is rather easy to be recognized and very hard to attain. So great consensus that people know when they see it, but they wouldn't be able to produce it themselves very easily. Based on these two different sources, the wisdom literature and uh, the lifespan literature, we came up with our definition of wisdom. Uh, which we define to be um, expert insight and judgment in the fundamental issues of life, pragmatics of life we called it, and basically dealing with these existential dilemmas that um, the human species is faced with. And then obviously this very general definition is not enough if you want to study um, a performance, you need to have quali quality criteria. Um, to be able to say, well, this kind of insight and judgment is better than this. And so we developed these five criteria that would allow us to make this kind of quality judgment and to just um, bring in some examples, uh, not necessarily do I have to go through all five. Um, so uh, for instance, one of them is lifespan contextualism, uh, which we defined to say if someone has wise insight and judgment in a given dilemma situation, the person would be able to illustrate how a certain problem situation is contextualized in different life domains. So the problem itself may arise out of a family context, but the family context doesn't exist in isolation. It needs to be seen as connected with, for instance, the work sphere, uh, the leisure sphere, the um, what sort of like what do I wish for myself as a person, as an individual, um, and then beyond the linkages between the life domains, we also need to contextualize on a time dimension. So any problem has a prior history how it developed and when it comes to intervening and trying to solve the problem, 
we need to take into consideration short-term, mid-term, and long-term consequences, which actually may be quite different from each other. Um, so you may, for instance, take into account negative short-term consequences, but being sure that in the mid and long term it will turn around and become positive. So s something, it, it may sound sort of like absurd at first to give advice that will immediately create a negative effect, but then this negative effect will turn around in the mid and long term. So it's this kind of uh, domain contextualization and timeline contextualization. And Another criterion is uh, what we have called um, value relativism. And this really describes the fact that someone who has wise insight and judgment is able to identify the value system that plays an important role for the target character or the main person in the problem, um, and how that value system influences the person's perceptions, the person's evaluations and actions, and takes it into account when trying to provide advice. Um, nevertheless, the value relativism criterion does not mean that it's an anything goes and a laissez-faire attitude, but rather that even though we acknowledge that someone may have that value, if the value conflicts with the highest wisdom value, which is to achieve a balance between the general and the greater good and in the, in the, in the individual good, then the person's value had to step in the background basically and has to, was overruled by this more general value orientation that guides wisdom, wise judgment. Um, so that's the value relativism. And the third meta criterion is the awareness and management of the uncertainties in life, um, which is the toughest one we always found. Um, so we mean by that that wise judgment acknowledges that human beings can never be able to perfectly predict the future, to with 100% certainty explain the past, neither do we have all the information in the present to make the perfect judgment. Nevertheless, we cannot sit in the corner, get depressed and not do anything. We have to get moving and manage this uncertainty. So someone who has wise judgment is able to produce, I would say, best guesses based on the intuitions and the evidence that is available at a given point in time. At the same time, as these are best guesses, a wise judgment, a wise person would very readily always check and monitor new evidence and intuitions coming up and then revise oneself and even say, well, 10 minutes ago, an hour ago, this is, was my best judgment, but now I know X, Y, and Z, and that's why I have to revise myself and really say this is what we should do now. So um, this is very hard because we have to acknowledge that we are not in perfect control and um, have to make the best out of it. Certainly there are ways we can strengthen um, certain ways and approaches to difficult life problems. And, and so I'm just meant, I just mentioned this tolerance or this perspective taking. We can encourage people to step into the shoes of others by exercises again and again. I guess it would have to be repeatedly so that we automatize it. Um, Certainly, I think we can strengthen, that's another Im, uh, aspect that we found that is really influential, is the emotion regulation. So we find that it is crucial making headway in our path on wisdom to be able to tolerate negative emotions. and rather than encouraging, which we often do and which is good because it is highly functional, 
to reframe and to do away with the negative emotion, to get on with our lives and come back to a balance in our well-being, to, for some insights to be gained, it is crucial to stick with the negative emotions and to learn from them rather than do away with them and reframe them right from the start. And um, that is another important distinction for me. It's this distinction between encouraging and supporting and facilitating resilience in the sense of adjustment and mastery, which is highly adaptive and which we need to have in order to master everyday life and which is strongly supported by societies because obviously societies want citizens who are capable and functioning and not depressed and um, falling in in parts um, so there's this one pathway which is strongly encouraged by a lot of societal institutions whereas the other pathway which I have come to call the wisdom pathway is not about mastery and adjustment it's beyond that it is about challenging the given and transcending the given and going to the bottom of things as hurtful as it might be uh, but by going to the bottom of things you learn more and you may be able to take the next step and um, so these two pathways um, they may crisscross as we mo walk through our lives, um, but very rarely are they uh, like completely aligned and they are, can be quite juxtaposed at times. That's why we think, for instance, that the personal wisdom goes down with age in, on average. Because mastering the last phase in life, like Eric Erickson has told us, mastering this last psychosocial crisis uh, of either finding integrity in your life or ending up in despair, there's this push towards integration. And in order to integrate, we have to brush over and ignore some of the, you know, side pathways or failures or just more unpleasant things in our lives which are not that important anymore because you know they are in the past and why should we um, concern ourselves with them now and jeopardize our well-being in the present and our, however that kind of attitude avoids learning from these failures from these wrong goings from these missed opportunities um, and so that's why I think we find this negative trend in personal wisdom in particular past age 55 or 60. It also has become a very interesting question would we expect someone who, who scores rather high um, on a wisdom measure, a true wisdom measure, uh, to also score above average on well-being? And my clear answer is no. Clear. And that's exactly what I tried to describe when I talked about the difference between a judgment uh, adjustment mastery and and wisdom and growth um, while we are on these pathways one of the sacrifices I think we make to being on the wisdom pathway is sacrificing well-being I, I have no doubt in my mind this may be different once you've attained if that's ever possible as a human being I don't know once we've attained the highest level, it may be different. I doubt it, however, that we would capture it with subjective well-being, our classical measures. I think then you're more in an area of contentment and, how should I say, you know, free-floating contentment that you probably wouldn't capture uh, with happiness uh, or well-being. I'm not sure.
But that is an ongoing debate.